it's your fifth year or? Hi everybody and welcome to Syria's security seminar here at Purdue University. Um, our speaker today is uh, Wabe uh, Kardashi and maybe some of you have seen Wabe before. He's actually a PhD student here working with Professor Ningui Lee and he is getting very close to graduating. So right. this is his fifth year. He's in the process of scheduling his PhD thesis. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk about one of the uh, research topics that uh, is part of his PhD thesis, and that is uh, how to differentially private, uh, uh, how to differentially private uh, publish uh, geospatial data. And uh, this is work that he will tell you, it will appear in um, ICD 2013, 2013, like in April. So you guys, you're going to get to see a the, sneak peek, a sneak peek <laughs> yes, of what's going to be in ICD. Wow. Thank you, Christina. Uh, so, as Christina said, I'll be presenting some exciting new research we've been doing in the area of differentially private data publishing. And in specific, I'll be talking about uh, some re research we've been doing in the area of differentially private publishing of geospatial data or location data sets, if you may. So I'm sure everyone here has a mobile device that has a GPS transponder most of us might use tablet devices that have that are GPS enabled. It, when we go out to our cars, we drive home, we might have a GPS navigation system in our car. And these uh, devices, these phones, these navigation systems, these tablets, continually send our precise location to centralized servers. So every time we use the map application on our iPhones or on our phones, we're sending our precise uh, location to some server. Every time we open Facebook, we update our status. The Facebook application might embed some location information. Every time we open Twitter, same thing happens. So this location information is logged somewhere on some centralized server. And I believe most of you here are researchers or graduate students. We all like to work with real data. So if this data set, if this location data set was released, then I'm sure we will all appreciate it. So if you release this location data set to some business, this business might use the information it can data mine from this location data set in order to enhance business intelligence. They can use this data set in order to make smarter decisions if they know, for example, how their demographic is distributed within a certain area. If we release this data set to researchers, then we can enable new avenues of research. For a couple of years ago, Netflix released some data set. It wasn't a geospatial data set, but this data set had tremendous impact on uh, research and data mining, as you might know. But the caveat, the problem with releasing such data sets to the public is privacy. So if these data sets are shared without proper anonymizations, then the privacy anonymization can be catastrophic. So you, don't, you certainly don't want everyone in the world to know your location every time you open the Maps application on your phone or every time you get in your car and you enable your GPS device. So my talk, in my talk, I'll discuss methods of releasing such geospatial data sets without compromising the privacy of any data constituent, of any particular individual whose location appears in this data set. So let me start by giving a very simple example. Let's say this is a geospatial data set. We have five people, we know their exact coordinates. I think we can all agree that we do not want to release the data set as is. If we release this data set, then we know, oh, Tom was here at this specific time, Lisa was there, Eve was there, and so on. So one simple method to anonymize this, you might say, is, oh, let's remove all personally identifying information. Let's remove everything that we can do, uh, we can use to identify a particular individual, and let's just publish their coordinates. Let's just publish this. So this offers a, a larger level of privacy, Sure, but if you look more into the level of privacy, you realize that this privacy crumbles under even the very slightest scrutiny. So let's say some malicious adversary 
or someone else for that matter, knows that Lisa lives in that boundary uh, which I indicate by a circle on the slide. If you know that, and you know that Lisa, for example, lives alone, then you can say, oh, then this point must be Lisa. And now, if I'm her boss, I know that Lisa, who pretended to be in the hospital, is at home watching movies. So I have obviously compromised the uh, privacy of Lisa. So let's not do this. Let's think of another way to release this data set. Let's say, OK, I don't want to release the exact coordinates. Instead, I want to find a way to partition this data set into some, in, in, in some manner. And then instead of releasing the exact coordinates, I'm going to release aggregate counts. So instead of uh, releasing the, these x's here, I'm just going to release numbers. I'm going to release two indicating that there are two people there, one indicating that there is one person there, and so on. So this, again, offers a greater level of privacy. But is this privacy good enough? Well, the answer is no. The reason, uh, the, the reason we, this does not offer significant levels of privacy is outliers. Let's say we know that Eve lives in this very exotic location. Let's say Eve lives in the middle of a cornfield. There are no people within a two-mile radius around Eve. Then I know that if this uh, area in my map refers to uh, a cornfield or is uh, close to where Eve lives, then I know that this one refers to Eve. And I've compromised the location of Eve. So we do not want to just release the data set in an arbitrary manner. We want to impose some very significant or very strong uh, privacy uh, definitions before we release this data set. Enter differential privacy. Now, differential privacy has been a very hot topic in the privacy arena. For, uh, it was introduced uh, 10 or so years ago, and it's becoming the de facto standard for uh, publishing uh, data sets or for performing private data mining on the data sets. And before I tell you how we're going to use differential privacy in order to anonymize geospatial data sets, let me describe what differential privacy is. So differential privacy tries to give you worst case privacy guarantees. It tries to say, I will afford you the luxury of not being in the data set when I release this data set. So if I have two data sets, one with your location information in it and one with your location information not in it, then I will probably release the same information. And we can characterize this by this mathematical inequality on the slide. The probability of two data set, the, prob the, the probability that I release the same thing given two data sets that differ on one tuple only is bounded. It is bounded by a small multiplicative factor. And this multiplicative factor is determined by e to the epsilon. Here, we refer to epsilon as the privacy parameter or the privacy budget. A smaller value of epsilon gives you greater privacy, whereas a larger value of epsilon gives you worse privacy. So the next question is, well, how do we use this mathematical formula in order to release uh, data sets or to compute functions while satisfying it? So let's say we have some function that we wish to compute in a differentially private manner. We can, if this function releases some integer, some fraction, some real number, then we can simply add noise to this number. And we choose this noise carefully such that we guarantee the privacy of any individual in the data set from which we are computing this function. So how can we uh, compute, choose this noise in a way to guarantee uh, privacy? Well, we can add noise proportional to the maximum change any particular individual can make on the data set. So let's say I'm trying to count the number of people in this room. If one person chooses to leave this room or chooses not to come here today, then the change in the count will be bound by 1. So instead of reporting 15, I'm going to report 16. 
And so I can add noise, which is sampled from the Laplace distribution with a uh, scale proportional to one. And with this, I can guarantee that the count that I release protects the privacy of any single individual in this room. So let me discuss a few more things concerning differential privacy before I get to applications of differential privacy for geospatial data. Now, I've, I've told you how we can use differential privacy to release one particular count or to compute one particular function. But in order to release a very large data set, we obviously need to compute more than one function. So does this increase our privacy? Does this decrease our privacy? What is the effect? Well, this falls into the arena of com uh, the composition properties of differential privacy. So if I have two differentially private functions that I wish to compute over my data set, and these two functions uh, use portions of the data set that overlap, then the effective privacy budget or the effective epsilon that I am satisfying for differential privacy will be the sum of the individual epsilon. On the other hand, if I'm computing two functions that are on two mutually exclusive partitions in my data set, let's say I decide to cut this room in half and count the number of people on the left and then the number of people on the right, then the effective uh, epsilon will be the maximum of these two epsilon. I no longer add them. So let's go back to the example I was giving. Let's say we want to release, we want to use a differentially private mechanism to release this data set uh, while satisfying epsilon differential privacy. Then what I can do is I can add uh, noise that is sampled from the Laplace distribution in this manner. I can add noise with uh, scale 1 over epsilon, since epsilon is my privacy parameter, and I'll be satisfying epsilon differential privacy. Note here that I changed the way that I partitioned the data set when it comes to differential privacy. And uh, that, that, that will help me make uh, a next important point. When I, if I, when I choose to partition the data set and then release the count of the individual of many uh, of uh, individual partitions in this data set, then I should choose the way I partition independently of the particular nodes in the data set. So I should not partition this room in half knowing that there are five more people on the right side than the left side. I should just choose this uh, partitioning independent of the data set itself. So now that I've told you what differential privacy is, and I've explained what geospatial data is, let me give a more precise uh, problem definition. So the problem that I will be trying to answer in this talk is if we have a two-dimensional data set where each tuple in this data set can be represented by a point in a, well, a very well-defined data domain, each tuple has an x-coordinate, has a y-coordinate, has a latitude or longitude, if you may. How can I release a synopsis of this data set in a differentially private manner? Now, the, my previous example, I've shown you a very simple way of releasing it. The, the challenge of using differentially, differential privacy in order to release such data sets is maintaining the utility of the data set. I don't want to simply say, oh, I have 50 people uh, in this area. No, I want to say that I have uh, 10 people in this region, 30 people in, that, uh, 30 people in that region, and so on and so forth. So I want to carefully choose a method of partitioning my data set into small cells, as you can see. And then I want to uh, issue differentially private count queries on each cell. I want to choose the cells in just a, such a way that I can still perform uh, analysis on this data set. And my analysis will, will produce accurate results as if I had the original data set itself. So we come to the question of how we measure the utility of the data set. Well, we assume that the data ana analyst will be issuing uh, range queries on this data set. And we define a range query as a rectangle over the data domain. 
So our data analyst will be ask, will be concerned with, oh, how many people do I have that live in this uh, rec in this blue rectangle? And these uh, blue rectangles might be anywhere in my uh, data domain. Do, they do not need to uh, be on the boundaries of any partition that I choose. So now that we have determined how to measure utility, we need to look at methods of partitioning the data set such that we maximize uh, this utility. And this brings me to my next point. What are the errors that can occur due to uh, releasing such data set in a differentially private manner? Well, we can summarize uh, the errors in two points. The first is the error due to differential pri the privacy itself. It's the error due to the noise that I'm adding. So as you, you may recall, I said that in order to release a function in a differentially private manner, we add noise that is sampled from the Laplace distribution. So this noise itself introduces some error. We can measure uh, this, uh, the variance of this error by looking at the variance of the Laplace distribution itself. So the Laplace distribution is a very well-defined uh, distribution. It has a very well-defined variance. If I'm adding uh, noise propor uh, proportional to 1 over epsilon, then my variance would be 2 over epsilon squared. And mind you that this variance increases linearly with uh, the number of cells that are in my query. So let's say I'm trying to issue a query that involves all these four cells, then my total variance will be 8 over epsilon squared. Uh, similarly, if I have n squares or n cells, my total variance will be 2n over epsilon squared. Now, Let's look at this error alone. And let's think about how we can uh, partition the data set, issue differentially private count queries, and minimize this error at the same time. Well, if we think about it for a bit, we realize that since this error increases linearly with the size of the query, I ideally want the query to be as big of a, as the size of the cell or the cell to be uh, as big as the size of the query so that my query only intersects with one cell and I just incur uh, an error variance of 2 over epsilon squared. So this would call for coarser partitioning of my data set. Now let's look at another source of error that we might incur. The other source of error is what I will call the non-uniformity error. So when I simply release the count of all the nodes that occur within one cell, I am assuming that all these nodes in the in this cell or these coordinates in the cell are uniformly distributed. But this might not be the case uh, in reality. Uh, for example, if you look at the slide here, I might have uh, the situation with the uh, cell on the top. I might have uh, eight of my coordinates occurring within the, the query range and one coordinate outside. Without knowing this distribution, and if I just want to answer this query, I'll just say that, oh, I, I only have uh, four nodes here, and therefore I have a standard deviation now of uh, four. I've given you an incorrect estimate of this, this error. So how can we minimize this error, well, we can do a finer grain partitioning. In the best case, I want to have only one or two uh, coordinates in each cell, and therefore, uh, whatever estimate I'll make, I won't be far away from uh, the true answer. So let's visit the two errors again. I have the noise error, which, uh, which is calling for a coarser partitioning of the data set, and then I have the non-uniformity error, which calls for a very fine-grained partitioning of the data set. The trick is, how can we uh, partition the data set while balancing these uh, two errors? I have transferred the problem into something similar to an optimization problem. But before I tell you 
what our method is, let me describe a few methods uh, that have previously been proposed uh, in this area. Now, previous approaches have tried to build a hierarchy over uh, the data domain. What they do is that they employ recursive partitioning. They partition the data domain multiple times. So they choose an axis, they partition on that axis, they issue count queries, and so on and so forth until some condition is satisfied. And then you issue count queries at different levels of granularity. So the very top level, you know the total count in the data set. The level below it, you know a very coarse grain count. And at the very, at the leaves, you know very fine grain counts. So let me give an example of uh, this recursive partitioning approach. One very prominent example uh, tries to uh, borrow a data structure from the database community. It tries to borrow a spatial indexing data structure called a KD tree. Now, those of you who know the KD, a K, what a KD tree is would know that it's basically a tree where the top, top node counts all the nodes in your data set. You partition your data set along a median of some axes and you end up with uh, two nodes. You continue partitioning along alternating axes until you get uh, to the, the, actual, um, uh, the actual nodes themselves. So let me give an example real quick. Let's say we have this data set with four, 15 points. Uh, first differentially private no uh, query I ask is, what is the total number of points? I get 15, this is my root node. Then I choose the median along some axes, in this case the x-axis. I get uh, two regions. I issue two new differentially private queries, and so on and so forth, until I satisfy some condition or until I run out of privacy budget. So th this seems good. But the, the caveat behind KD tree is that we need to divide our privacy budget. We need to divide our epsilon among all the levels in the tree. Furthermore, at each level, I cannot use all the epsilon dedicated at that level to issue a count query. I need to use this epsilon to issue a query for the median because I cannot know the median in a non-differentially private way. And then I'm going to use the remainder to issue a count query. So I'm utilizing my privacy budget. I'm decreasing the epsilon I use for each differentially private query. And therefore, I, I am increasing my noise error. So let's try not to uh, do a query for the median. Let's say we want to do uh, fixed partitioning at each level. And this is something similar to what's called a quad tree. A quad tree tries to divide the data domain recursively into four quadrants at each level. So at the very top level, I divide the whole domain into four regions. I issue four differentially private queries. And then I divide each subregion into four quadrants as well, more differentially private queries, and so on. And then I stop when the tree reaches a specific depth. Uh, Previous literature has shown that uh, a tree of depth 10 is, uh, produces reasonably uh, good results. But let's think, about for, uh, let's think about that for a second. Well, I just said that in order to decrease our non-uniformity error using the quad tree approach, it has been shown that uh, a tree of depth 10 gives uh, more or less a reasonable approximation. This means that I'm taking my epsilon and I'm dividing it along uh, uh, across 10 levels. And this means that each differentially private query I have uses one-tenth of my whole privacy budget. And I have therefore increased the noise variance by a factor of 100 at each level. So this might not be ideal. Sure, we can use some fancy techniques like constraint inference and other uh, stuff in order to decrease this error, but we, we are still increasing the noise error at each level substantially. But those of you who are familiar with 
uh, differential privacy might say, oh, but this technique works well for single dimensional data sets. And I totally agree. A uh, level of depth 10 works very well for single dimensional data sets, but I would argue that it doesn't really work that well for two dimensional data sets. Let me real quick try to tell you why I think this is the case. Let's look at a one dimensional data set and let's say I'm uh, recursively dividing my uh, one dimensional domain. Let's say here I'm dividing uh, the, these eight cells into groups of two. And then I release, uh, I build a tree, I issue count queries at each level of the tree, and then uh, I release this data set. Some data analysts might wish to uh, compute uh, uh, a range query over this uh, blue area right here. And he would use, uh, for the very middle uh, cells, he would use, uh, he would use uh, cells that are higher up in the tree in order to answer the query. And therefore, instead of using four cells, he might end up using only one cell. But for the nodes that fall on the boundary regions, I'm more likely going to use the leaf nodes in order to answer the query. And th these are indicated by the Xs. So if I have M cells, a histogram with M uh, bins, and I'm building a tree with a branching factor B, which means that I'm grouping B cells together at each uh, level, then the proportion of the total range that this uh, query is occupying is B over M. And since for each query I have two border regions, my <coughs> the, the number the percentage of the total area that I'm answering using leaf nodes uh, is approximately 2b over m. Now let's look at the case with uh, the two, dimen two dimensions. As you can see, the number of x's in this uh, figure increased. We no longer have two x's, we have more. That's because we have four borders. And if I continue using the same parameter as a branching factor of B and M total cells, then the total proportion that these border regions are occupying are 4 square root of B over square root of M. Now let me put this into uh, a better context. Let me give you a more concrete example. Let's say I'm, I'm building a tree with branching factor 4 and I have 10,000 cells. Then in the one-dimensional case, uh, the border regions, the regions using the leaf nodes, or the regions that are using, that are incurring more noise error, are approximately 0.08% of my total domain. When we move to, two, uh, to the two-dimensional case, this number increases by a factor of 100. This is almost 8% uh, uh, in this example. So yes, for the one-dimensional case, building a hierarchy might be good. For the two-dimensional case, I would argue that let's not build a hierarchy. Let's look at other methods, and let's try to improve upon those. Furthermore, I want to use, uh, want to choose the techniques while keeping the two sources of error in mind. I want to choose a technique that makes it easier for me to optimize for the two uh, sources of error. And this is where our work uh, comes in. We propose using what we call grid-based approaches for uh, differentially private publishing of geospatial data. And the key idea behind this is that we want to avoid dividing our privacy budget among 10 levels. We want to stick with uh, a flat approach. We want to stick with one level or two levels at the very max. And we want to choose the way we partition the data set, the way we choose our individual cells in order to man minimize the noise error and the non-uniformity error. So let me start with a very simple approach. We call this approach the uniform grid. Now this approach is by no means new. This is a direct application of differential privacy. This simply partitions the domain into a fixed M by M equi 
with equi-height cells, or cells of equal size, and then I issue differentially private queries on each cell. I no longer ha have, a, have a hierarchy, so I no longer have to divide my privacy budget. I can just use the entire privacy budget to answer a differentially private query at, uh, the, at the grid itself. The challenge to employing this method and the challenge that has not been previously thought of is how can we choose M in order to minimize the error due to differential privacy in order to minimize the error due to non-uniformity. And let me give you uh, some brief uh, uh, sort of introduction into how we uh, decided to choose M in order to minimize these two errors. Let's first look at the noise error. Let's look at the standard deviation of the noise error. As I said before, the standard deviation of, for the Laplace distribution with uh, scale 1 over epsilon is square root of 2 over epsilon. So I have a standard deviation of square root of 2 over epsilon per cell. Let's say I have a query, a rectangle, and this rectangle occupies R percent of my total domain let's say 5% of my total domain. Then the total standard deviation that I would incur if I choose to answer this query is square root of 2 r m squared over epsilon. It's shown on the slide. Now let's look at the non-uniformity error. The non-uniformity error is only determined by the cells which fall on the boundary of the query. If a cell is completely included, then I don't really care about non-uniformity error. If a cell intersects the boundary of the query that I'm uh, asking, then it might contribute to the non-uniformity error. So if I have a query that, again, is asking for 5% of my domain, then the proportion of this that are occupied by border cells are square root of 5m, or square root of rm. And the standard deviation of the non-uniformity error can be approximated by the total number of points in that cell. We can approximate that by just dividing the total number of points in the whole data set by the total number of cells that we have. So we can approximate it by this number right here on the slide, uh, square root of R n n, which is the total number of points in the data set, over m, and then I have some small constant uh, factor that represents the non-uniform, the distribution of points in the data set itself. So the, the next step is to choose a value of m that minimizes both the noise error and the non-uniformity error. So I've turned this into an optimization problem. I want to choose the smallest m such that this sum is minimized. And it turns out that the best m to choose would be square root of n epsilon over c, where c is some small constant greater than 1. In our experiments, we have seen that uh, choosing this constant to be around 10 is good for most data sets. In reality, uh, any value of c that is between 0 and, let's say, 20 or 30 should give you more or less uh, good results. So uh, you might uh, interject here and tell me, oh, you're using n. n is the total number of points in the data set. This is not public information. Well, if the total number of points uh, in the data set is not public information, then you can issue a differentially private query in order to get n. You can use uh, a very small portion of uh, your privacy budget in order to get this n. And since this is an approximation, you would still get m within uh, a good range or, or the ballpark that you want. Now this is good, but this is not the, the best method. The problem with this method is that it treats all regions equally. So if a region is very sparse, then I'm very likely going to over partition that region. I'm going to get cells that have no points in them and I'm going to increase my noise error because I'm just going to be adding Laplace noise to zero, and I'm going to get some random number that, I'm, that, I, that I have to use in my analysis. Uh, 
On the other hand, if some region is very sparse, then I might underpartition. I might have 500,000 nodes in this very small cell, and this would just throw off my non-uniformity error. So I don't want, I don't want to do this. Let me give uh, a quick example to show why this is, why this might be uh, not beneficial. Let's say my data set looks something like this. I have this one point on the corner in the in my data domain, and then I have a lot of points in the other corner. If I decide to do a uniform grid approach, I might, uh, sorry, I might end up with a grid that looks like this. As you can see, I have around, uh, what is it, uh, 10, more than 10 uh, cells that, are, that do not have any uh, nodes in them, while I have one or two cells that have a very large number of uh, points in them. And this is not ideal. Technically, I only want, I want that cell to be uh, a very coarse grain partition, while I want this uh, other region to be a very fine grain partition. And this type of, of data is very prominent. I'm not just making up this example. So this is a, a, a visualization of a real world data set that we got from check-ins in a social networking site. And uh, you can more or less tell where the continents are. You can see that, oh, a lot of people are checking in in, a in uh, the US, a lot of people are checking in in Europe, but not so many are checking in in Africa and Asia and so on. So we want to choose our partitioning or choose how to partition in a better way. And so we introduce a more adaptive uh, method of partitioning, which we call adaptive grids. The main idea behind adaptive grids is that we want to adapt the level of partitioning based on the number of data points in that region. So if a region is very dense, we want to use finer grain partitioning. If it's sparse, a coarser grain partitioning. So how can we do that? We can easily achieve this by just having two levels of partitioning. So first, we get our uh, data domain and we div uh, divide this uh, data domain in a very coarse manner. We lay a very coarse grid of a specified size and we issue differentially private count queries using some proportion alpha epsilon of our privacy budget. Then, based on this noisy count that I get on, in this very coarse level, I choose how to partition that further. So if my noisy count is very large, I'm going to choose uh, smaller cells in my second level partitioning. If it's small, I'm going to choose larger cells. So if we go back to that example here, we might, uh, uh, at the very first level of partitioning, we might choose to divide this into four quadrants. Now we know that, oh, we have a very dense region and we have a very sparse region. So my second level partitioning can take that into consideration. And this will help me decrease my non-uniformity error without increasing my noise error. The challenge here is, again, how do I choose the granularity of the first level of partitioning and how do I choose the granularity of the second level of partitioning? Let me start with the second level. Oh, oh, but before I do that, let me uh, describe a method that we do after we get the counts at the course level and the, uh, at the first level and the counts uh, at the second level. Since we are issuing redundant queries, if you may, since uh, we're issuing a query for this big uh, rectangle right there, and then we're issuing a query for the very small rectangles, and the sum of these small rectangles should equal the sum of the larger rectangle, we should, uh, we, can, we can apply a fancy technique that has been proposed in the literature in order to uh, decrease the variance by uh, using the redundancy I have from the variance of the big cell and the small variances of the little cells. And while I won't go into, into details as to uh, the optimization that's done here, 
I'll just uh, tell you, give you a brief overview of what this method is. This method is called constraint inference. We basically just choose a weighted average of the count at the very small cells uh, in addition to the count at the larger cells in order to improve the count at the larger cell. And then I make sure that the sum of the small cells equal the sum of the larger cells. And this is basically done by applying a very simple mathematical formula using parameters that can be uh, calculated. And I'm not going to go into too much deta detail with this. Instead, I'll just focus on the adaptive grids. And I'll focus on how we choose the first level partitioning, how we choose the second level partitioning. And I'm going to start with the second level partitioning. So let's think about a query that we're trying to answer that we want to use second level cells for, or leaf cells for. If we're going to use the leaf cells, then we know that this query would include up to M2 minus 1 rows or columns, where M2 is the granularity of the second level partitioning. So on average, if I take all my range queries into consideration, on average my range queries are going to use on the order of M squared over 4 uh, cells, and uh, we can calculate this using this uh, formula right here. So I know that the average noise error per cell is determined by my uh, privacy budget and by the Laplace noise that I'm adding. And I, again, I know what my non-uniformity error is because I more or less have a good estimate of what I expect the number of uh, nodes in each cell to be. So I can minimize the sum of these two errors in the same way I minimize the sum of the errors for the uniform grid approach and I can get uh, an estimate as to what I want my second level partitioning to be. And notice here that uh, if my noisy count is larger, M2 is going to be larger. If on the other hand it's small, I only have, my noisy count is only one, then I'm likely not going to partition further. M2 will probably be one. For the first level partitioning, it, the, this value appears to be less critical. As long as it's uh, coarse partitioning, as long as I don't over partition, as long as I choose a number that's significantly less than the number I would choose for the uniform grid approach, then uh, I'm usually safe. And uh, some analysis uh, gave us this formula right here. We want uh, something smaller than the uniform grid approach and we don't want it to be, let's say, greater than some constant. We don't want it to be greater than 10. We don't want to over partition. We just want to have a very general idea of uh, what the data set looks like. And note here that if I do end up over partitioning or under partitioning here, then I make up for it in, uh, when I choose the second level, when I choose M2, because I'm, I'm going to have a better idea of my data set at that point, because I'm going to uh, have answers to the differentially private count queries from the first level. So let me talk more about the efficiency of the grid approaches. So in order to implement the uniform grid approach, I only need to do one pass of the data set. Data set. I know the number of points. I just need to uh, count the number of points in each region. It's uh, order of n complexity. If I want to do the adaptive grid, grid approach, then I just need to do two passes over my data set, order of 2n. On the other hand, all the recursive partitioning approaches, I have to do this at each level of partitioning. So it's around order of n log n, if you want to talk about the complexity uh, in terms of uh, the number of points. So yes, the, the, these approaches are the uniform grid approach, the adaptive grid approach are uh, more efficient, and I would argue that they would give you be uh, good results. In order to f further convince you as to why they give you good results, I'm going to show you uh, some experimental results that we have uh, 
uh, conducted in order to compare all these uh, different approaches. For our experimental results, we used four real-world data sets. We used the check-in data sets I showed you earlier on, with, um, uh, where each point represents a check-in on a, on a social networking site. We used uh, a road data set, which uh, includes road intersections in uh, New Mexico and Washington. And this is on the top right. As you can see, you can easily tell the shape of Washington, the shape of New Mexico. We use a landmark data set, which includes the um, positions of landmarks in the US, including uh, popular landmarks, schools, so on and so forth. And we used uh, what we call a storage data set, which includes a uh, location of uh, storage location that are used by some business. And you know, the, these data sets were available online. These were not anonymized. And therefore, uh, it was nice to uh, uh, run some experiments using them. So let me start with the uniform grid approach, our analysis for the uniform grid approach. And let's see how well our approximations for uh, the grid size performed. So here we're using, uh, I'm going to present the values for two, value, uh, for two uh, values of epsilon, epsilon 0 0.1, epsilon 1.0. 0 0.1 gives you uh, better privacy guarantees. So. UG suggested is what our analysis, analysis suggested, and UG actual is what our experiment suggested that we use. And you can notice that UG actual, uh, I'm presenting it in a range here because, well, at, at, at between those, it doesn't really matter which precise one you choose to go with. It, if, you, if you go with a coarser one, then uh, coarser query, then larger queries are going to uh, give you better results if you go with smaller ones, smaller queries, and so on. But what you can notice is that in uh, almost all of the results, our, uh, our predicted value was, was pretty good. The only exception that's uh, worth noting is the road data set with epsilon equals 1.0. Here we decided to over partition. Uh, we predicted 100 while the best was probably up to 192, but uh, the road data set itself was a bit unusual. If you look back at the top right, it ha you would notice that it's very dense in some areas, less dense in other areas. And, but this itself uh, brings into question the validity of the uniform grids, Bring, brings into question the disadvantage of the uniform grids approach that I uh, discussed, mainly that it's not adaptive. It doesn't know what the data set is. It just chooses the level of partitioning based on the number of nodes in the data set. So let's look at real experimental results. Let's compare the KD tree approach with the uniform grid approach. The KD tree approach is a hierarchical recursive partitioning approach, while the uniform grid approach is very basic. It just lays the uniform grid and um, does differentially private count queries. Before I comment on the results, let me uh, explain these strange graphs. So the graph on the right, uh, or the graph on the left, <laughs> we are uh, presenting six query sizes. Q1 is uh, a small query size. Q2 doubles the size of Q1. Q3 doubles Q2, and so on, until we get to Q6. Q6 covers between 25% to 50% of the data domain. For each query size, we issued 200 randomly generated queries. Uh, we got the answers and we compared them with the, we compared the answers from the anonymized data set and with the non-anonymized data set. For the graph on the right, uh, we decided to give a better view of the results we are getting. We didn't want to simply report the mean of the results. We didn't want to report the median of the results. We want to show you how uh, different queries were performing. So the black bars in that graph are the mean, 
Uh, the very bottom blue bar represents the 25th percentile. Above it is the 50th percentile, 75th percentile, and the very top is the 95th percentile. So the 95th means that 95% of the queries are performing better than uh, the result indicated by the line. So these graphs are for the storage data set with epsilon 0 0.1. This gives a very good level of privacy. And let's compare the KD tree uh, approach with the uniform grid approach. Here you can notice that the red line, which is uh, a simple KD tree approach, performs the worst, which, is, which wasn't really expected because, oh, this does fancy hierarchical partitioning while the uniform grid just lays a grid. Well, it turns out that just laying a grid, devoting your whole privacy budget to answer your differentially private counts is better than doing the, this uh, fancy division. We also experimented with another version of KD tree, which is KD hybrid. This uses the KD tree approach for the first few levels and then switches to the quad tree approach. This way we don't, you, uh, we don't waste uh, more of our privacy budget performing uh, for the um, median calculations. And that performs slightly better, but you could clearly see that the uniform grid approach in almost all query sizes uh, performs better than the KD tree approach. And this uh, result also holds for the road data set. Here you can see an even greater, greater uh, difference between the KD tree and uh, the uniform grid approaches, as well as the landmark data set, and so on. So you might say, oh, well, this is the KD tree approach. How about other hierarchical approaches? Well, it turns out that uh, these more or less uh, give the same results. For the hierarchical approaches, we decided to uh, do some experiments with something beyond just the quad tree. We decided to build hierarchies with different depths, with different branching factors, and so on and so forth. And these are represented by the etches in the, in the graph. The uniform grid approach still performs better than all the hierarchical approaches. Now, I have a few exceptions here. We did some experiments with what is called the wavelet method. Wavelet method uh, uses a hard wavelet transform over the data set and then issues the differentially private queries. Uh, in this case, the Haar wavelet transform performed better than the uniform grid approach and even performed better than the quad tree approach, which uh, does some optimization on the division of privacy budget. And this is uh, the wavelet method is indicated by the W, while the uh, optimized quad tree approach, which uses some fancy division of privacy budget, is the uh, line on the very right, uh, which is indicated by quad opt. So hier hierarchical approaches, unless you use something close to the wavelet or unless you do, you do some analysis with your division of privacy budget, are not going to perform better than the very simple uniform grid approach. So how about the adaptive grid approaches? Does it uh, live up to uh, the results uh, if we compare it with uh, the uniform grid, with the hierarchical methods, with the wavelet methods? turns out that the answer is yes. So for each of these graphs, we took the best uh, uniform uh, grid parameters. We took the best parameters for the hierarchical approaches. In most cases, they were the parameters for the wavelet method. And then we uh, did some analysis uh, for the best parameters of the adaptive grid approach, and we compared our results. And it turns out that the adaptive grid approach is still able to reduce the relative error by a very significant amount. And this holds for various data sets, as you can see by my graphs. Here are the very top lines uh, for the check-in data set, for instance, are respectively the uniform grid approach and then the wavelet approach, while the other adaptive grid, grid approaches with various parameters that we experimented with Perform, uh, these uh, performed better. They, give, they gave smaller relative error than the rest.
And this holds for uh, all the uh, other data sets that we have experimented with. In some cases, we found that the quad tree approach might perform better. In other cases, it, it, it performed worse. Upon further analysis, we find out that in some cases, we can choose uh, a good depth of partitioning for the quad tree approach. In other cases, we, we can't. And since uh, this approach is so complex that we can't really analyze what the best uh, division is, what the, what the best uh, division of privacy budget is, what the best uh, division, um, what, what the best number of levels is, that is, uh, then uh, we cannot really optimize the quad uh, tree approach. So the other approach is still uh, performed uh, better. The adaptive grid, grid approach seems to be performing uh, the best in all our experiments. Uh, the last couple of graphs I'm going to show you, we decided to rep report the absolute error uh, to see if there are some changes there. Uh, we took the best, uh, the, the best parameters for each method, the best parameters for the KD tree, best parameters for the quad tree, uniform grid, adaptive grid, uh, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, for all, my data, for all the data sets, the results seem to indicate that the best approach to use seem, is the adaptive grid approach. And this stems from the simplicity of this approach. This stems from our ability to analyze what the best parameters for uh, this approach is. Let me just summarize uh, what I have presented before uh, I take any questions you might have. So, in my talk, I've tried to analyze the effect of dimensionality on hierarchical methods, how this relates to uh, geospatial data publishing, publishing two-dimensional data sets. Now, I've, we've tried to analyze sources of error due to uh, two-dimensional differentially private uh, data publishing or synapses, uh, releasing a synapsis of the data set. We've identified the noise error and the non-uniformity error as the errors that are contributing most towards uh, uh, the errors in data analysis proposed very simple methods, the adaptive grid method and the uniform grid method, that seem to be performing better than uh, most hierarchical approaches. And this is basically all I have. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay then, thank you for having me.